Thank you very much, Ignacio, and very welcome to all of you. I hope you're enjoying this stunning city, um, and also I really hope that you will enjoy these days here as much as I'm planning to do. I want to explore with you how can we unleash the power of the universities. Let's think for a moment in universities as a powerhouse that can really transform some of the most complex challenges that we face as a society into opportunities. So for that, I want to you to think in what is the image that comes to your mind when you think in the world is changing. Some of you might think in flying cars, some of you might think in very high-tech things, but I have this picture to you, which is, might, might not be the picture that comes to your mind, I might understand, but if you have a look at this gentleman here, and I wish I had women, by the way, all of them some, have something in common very interesting. They all if you, go, if you look beyond the color of their skin, beyond the countries they represent, they all have been in power for a long time, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. But there's something even more interesting than that. They all represent a significant change in the life expectancy of our population. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute. So there are a few things changing today. Some people talk about globalization and others about deglobalization. But the truth is, there is a decentralization of power. If you have a look at the uh, stunning expansion of China in the academic production, we will see that they are producing more PhD stems, more conference proceedings, more conference, more academic events. And very soon, they will produce uh, the budget in R&D will be higher than the one in the US. So this obviously will have significant implications in this century in terms of the academic power. But there are a number of other factors that are today shaping education. A globalization or deglobalization, whatever you want to call it, a foreign industrial revolution, an incredibly accelerated change in technology, but also I think to some extent, despite painful, as Ignacio said, COVID has been a moment of disruption. And also we will explore in a moment why demographic change also can have implications in the shape of education. But I'm going to address three key factors which I think are essential. One is climate change. The second one is a data-intensive society. And the number three is extension in the lifespan. And if you don't trust me, ask Irene, who decided to skydive with more than 100 years hitting the world record. Now, I think today we are living in a sort of collection of crises. Certainly, I'm not going to refer to all the difficult crises that we're facing today as a planet, but I will address three crises which I think are really important. They work to some extent as a cluster of global related risk that produce a sort of compound effect that interestingly, such interaction goes beyond the sum of each part. So if we want to address these challenges, we will need a new thinking, different to the thinking that we use to create those problems, as paraphrasing Einstein. What do I mean with that? Let's start with my friend, Pitman Copper. He reached a high school diploma last year with 101 years old. What do you think? So despite some personal situations that had forced him to interrupt his education in the 1940 of the last century, he recently got this high school diploma making a, a global news. And I think he's a, such a source of inspiration, very similar to the phrase of Michelangelo when he said in his late 80s, I'm still learning. And I think there's some lessons that we take out of that. Probably some of you read this book, Outliers, which basically said, if you want to be good at something, you have to invest 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours roughly means 20 hours per week during 10 years, which might sound like a lot. But if you have a look at the UN projections, the age group, which is 65 years old or more, is expected to grow significantly in the decades to come. Because demographic is changed. In 1950, the average age in the planet was 24 years old. By the end of this century, the average age in this planet will be 42 years old. And the centenarians are expected to grow a lot, 50 times, meaning that by the end of this century, we might end up having 26 million human beings with more than 100 years old, roughly half of Italy, can you imagine half of Italy asking for a ristretto with more than 100 years old? That's going to be a beautiful picture. Now, today we live in a world that has a 
quite strange message. The message today in the labor market is you have to study as much as you can, get as many degrees as you can, as young as possible to be employable. And I think today we can challenge that perspective. Let's think, for instance, in uh, Maria. Maria will be born in Seville in 2025. She will get to high school in 2040. And if she's lucky, she will get a PhD in 2060. Right? So Maria can easily live until 2,110 years, meaning 50 years after her PhD. What is the point, I ask you, of expecting that Maria won't have any learning process during 50 years? It makes little sense, isn't it? So we can rethink how we can parcel the learning journey in a much more continuous way. So this aging population will bring some challenges, certainly in the labor market, in terms of pensions, insurance, health. But the question is, what about education? Are universities ready to offer intergenerational communities of learning? That's a real opportunity to really embrace the lifelong learning in a serious way, not only these very nice and sexy phrases that sometimes we hear here and there. In the 18th century, for instance, in this planet, we were one billion human beings. Now we are eight. And later in this century, we will reach to 10. But beyond that, there is another factor. There is a reduction in the fertility levels as a result of a slower pace of population growth. So the population is changing significantly in a short time. So a real driver of change here is because of this combination of declining in the birth rate, increasing longevity, and improved health, people will be living longer. In OECD countries, for instance, the life expectancy reached to 80 years. In the US, for instance, by the mid of this century, 90 million human beings will have more than 65 years old. So I think it's reasonable to expect that if you are a white collar and you have your cognitive capacities working well, you can easily work till 70s. I know that might not be very popular, but that's a possibility. Now, we will have to fight an age discrimination that is embedded in the, in the core of the society. Right? We have to move away from these stereotypes. So, in a nutshell, the population has increased four times in the last century, but the birth rates have fallen significantly in all over the world, except in Africa. So that's a projection of what would happen in the planet if they replicate the birth rate of the US. But on the right-hand side, there is another interesting factor. The birth rate is strongly associated with the living standards of the people. So the higher the living standard, the more negative is the birth rate. So for those of you who might be thinking that this might be good news for the environment, I'm afraid to say the environment needs actions today, and the changes in the population will take way longer time. So we have to take actions of the environment anyway soon. In, just in case that you saw the book 2030 from Mauro Guillén, he also bring another interesting trend. By 2030, at least in the US, there will be more grandchildren than grandfathers. That's really interesting, because they will be in a better shape, better mental conditions, they will be living, living longer, up to 25 years more than the previous generations. So it's going to be the very first generation outnumbered by the people over 60. I think it's fascinating. So you can have a look, for instance, at the demographic dividend between the US, which is very similar to the one in Belgium, for instance, to the one in Cameroon. And I think the differences are stunning. Now, please don't confuse all what I'm saying with those Silicon Valley guys who want to extend life taking pills all the time and trying to monitor their body because that's a different thing, and I'm not talking about reverse longevity. Now, when I mean the idea of changing the mindset, I want to show you this video to see if you know what I mean. Let's have a look at the video. I am 83 years old. Uh, I was, I was uh, in the McDonald's drive through this morning. The young lady behind me leaned on her horn and, and, and started mouthing some ugly things because I was taking too long to place my order. So when I got to the first window, I paid for her order along with, with my own. The cashier must have told her what I had done because as we moved up, she leaned out her window and, and, and waved to me uh, as she began mouthing, thank you, thank you, probably feeling embarrassed that I had repaid her rudeness 
with kindness. When I got to the second window, I showed the server both receipts and I took her food too. <laughs> now she has to go back to the end of the queue and start <laughs> and start all over again. Don't blow your horn at old people. We've been around for a long time. All right, all right. That's great, isn't it? So I have a very good news. Talking about this change of mindset. In Germany, there was conducted a study that was released only a few months ago, which focused on 3,000 ventures. And they identified something that is really capable of changing this stereotype that older business don't thrive. But older business are not innovative. And this study, it really shows that those who create companies with 50 years old or more can really disrupt the market, either produ producing new services or creating new technologies. That, those, those findings that you can access through that QR code are one of the strongest, most recent evidence that shows that late career entrepreneurs can be really, really successful. So I know today we have a number of universities we offer programs for the golden agers. But I think given the changes in demographic, we need to move from the outlier initiatives into the mainstream, and universities have to think carefully how to address this disruption. Let me move to the second driver, global change. So we have a number of very hard news these days, right? We have long-term rise of sea levels, deadly heat waves, floods over the place, droughts, loss of biodiversity, ocean acidification is increasing, we have increase in, in pollution, and sadly we have more frequent wildfires. So I think it's quite clear that we have to find a better balance between profit and planet, but the baseline is we have to find more structures to change our crazy consumption of fossil fuels. I'm not saying anything that you don't know. But I think 2023 has been a very hard year because we have hit record-breaking levels of ocean heat, right? That can have devastating consequences into the marine ecosystem. In the US, local agencies are projecting that in Florida, the sea level can rise up to 100 centimeters by 2070. So who would have said that in Miami Beach, you can have climate refugees, right? Um, also, in, in that part of the world, a few weeks ago, uh, one of the strongest ever storms produced and the faster created um, produced devastating uh, consequences in the coast of Mexico. So the faster the hurricane is created, the harder it's going to be to forecast and to announce to the people generating very serious social impact. So we have some things to recraft. So according to Holong IQ, um, we have problems from destruction, but also the disposal. They mentioned that 20% of the world forest has been lost. And half of it, please remember this, half of it occurred in the last century. I think it's outstanding. But also in terms of disposal, we have this crazy guy, uh, Rob Greenfield, who decided to carry in his body all the rubbish that we produce in a month. So he ended up carrying 60 kilos of rubbish just to increase awareness. So the question I have for you is, how can we make universities more stronger in the idea of pro promoting sustainability principles, regardless of the career or the background of our students? This has to be something much more transversal. So we have very serious news every day, and sometimes I worry that we can get a little bit immune with this bad news. But the truth is when we explore a little bit, we learn that some serious institutes like the Institute of Economics and Peace are projected by during this century, we can have up to 1.2 billion human beings who can be climate refugees. Imagine, it's almost the whole population of India, right? So this is a clear example of a wicked problem that requires a really adaptive approach. It will require multiple perspectives, and it's going to be complex and difficult to change. But also, that's an outstanding opportunity to prepare and educate problem solvers, a new generation of people capable of breaking down problems, to run diagnosis, to identify patterns, and to reformulate. 
And I think this is what we want. People who are sensitive of the challenges of the environment, but also can think through different disciplines in an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary perspective to address problems that could be of global relevance. Now, let's move to the technology. I love technology. However, we have to be sensitive of some of the backtracks of the technology today. We have serious problems in terms of privacy concern. We have a lot of challenges to address in terms of algorithmic bias. We have a tremendous concentration of data, which produced several challenges in terms of data and sovereignty between the global north and the global south. And also, we have a serious gap between the accelerated change of technology and the complexity of institutions to learn how to regulate those. So we have to find ways of aligning the expansion of AI, for instance, with the human values and not in the other way around. Right? But at the same time, from the academic perspective, we will have to think, what does it mean to use technologies that produce knowledge or something very similar to knowledge these days? Let me show you this video and we can continue. Hi, is this Pizza Hut? No, sir, it's Google Pizza. Oh, sorry, I must have dialed the wrong number. No, sir, Google bought Pizza Hut last month. Okay, I'd like to order a pizza then. Do you want your usual? My usual? Do you know me? According to our database, the last 12 times you called, you ordered an extra large pizza with three cheeses, sausage pepperoni mushrooms, and meatballs on a thick crust. Super! Yeah, that's what I want. May I suggest that this time you order a vegetarian pizza with sun-dried tomatoes on a whole wheat gluten-free crust? Shit, no. I don't want a vegetarian pizza. It sucks. It's too healthy. Your cholesterol is no good. How in the hell did you know that? We cross-referenced your home phone number with your medical records. We have the results of your blood tests for the last seven years. Well, either way, I don't want your goddamn vegetarian pizza. I take medication for the cholesterol problem. Excuse me, sir, but you have not taken your medication regularly. According to our database, you purchased only a box of 30 tablets once at Superfarm Pharmacy for months ago. I bought more from another pharmacy. That doesn't show on your credit card statement. Well, I paid in cash, that's why. But you did not withdraw enough cash according to your bank statement. Jesus Christ, I have other sources of money. That doesn't show on your latest tax returns, unless you bought them using an undeclared income source, which is illegal. What the hell? Somehow you have my tax records? This is nuts! I'm sorry, sir. We use such information only with the sole intention of helping you. I'm sick and tired of Google and Twitter and WhatsApp and all that shit. I'm going to a desert island where I don't have to deal with any of that shit. I understand, but you need to renew your passport first. It expired six weeks ago. How in the hell did you know about my passport being expired? I was going to renew it. Jesus Christ, what's wrong with our country? Well, welcome to the new world. The new world is here, and it's scary. So everyone be ready, because that's what's happening. And have a good evening. All right, all right. I think it's too, it's too early to have a good evening, but we can, we can continue in the discussion. Some of you might remember this article from Peter Drucker in the late 50s, in which he coined the concept of the knowledge worker. The knowledge worker ended up being the protagonist of the knowledge society, right? Uh, and then Levy and Mornane, they developed this very, very well-known chart that really illustrates the decrease in the labor market in the US of um, non-cognitive tasks, which are more routinary, and increasing those cognitive tasks which are non-routinary. In other words, the blue collars and the white collars. So if you were in the white side of the spectrum, you were safe. All good. But things are starting to change. With the emergence of Gen AI, agencies like uh, McKinsey are suggesting that those activities conducted by the most educated are the ones which are more exposed to be displaced by these systems. Right? So it's really at least challenging this whole idea of the white and the blue colors. That's why the, the picture is a kind of a joke. Now, according to Princeton, there are some projections that some of the tasks developed by different professions can be more or less exposed to be displaced or automated. 
in sales, business, management, even coding can be this place. Interestingly, nursing is much more safe. And I think that says a lot about the relevance of developing social emotional capacity, social emotional intelligence. So I guess at the university level, we have to balance this trade between automation and productivity. What can be enhanced and what can be displaced? Um, my, oh, sorry. Um, my invitation is look at the left hand side of the family picture and we will see how the robots have been evolving crazily during the last decades. Uh, so many of these robots have been developed in labs. Uh, many of us don't have these labs, these, these, these robots at home, unless you might have a vacuum cleaner. Uh, but most of these things are hidden in the communities of experts. But there are another side of the AI that is reaching our pockets. Recently, um, generative AI now can have human vision, uh, computer, sorry, computer vision. So you can take a picture of um, a crazy traffic light, or a traffic sign, sorry, and you can try to read through all these little nuggets of information where you can park. So easily this information can help you to decode a complex reality. So the difference between the left and the right is AI fluency, capacity to, to understand and navigate these tools. These are the opportunities. But I guess we also need to be able to navigate some of the challenges. And there are some challenges associated. The first one is um, systems that can really manipulate or produce misinformation in an automatic way. Similarly, we are more and more aware that the, depending on the training that these systems, the data these systems have been trained with, it, have, it can have lower or higher levels of bias, misrepresentation, overrepresenting some, some realities and misrepresenting others or underrepresenting them, right? So that's why it's so important to increase the level of transparency and as well as developing new tools for addressing the challenges in privacy, not only when you order a pizza. Now, we have some side effects as well. A crazy amount of uh, carbon footprint that training these algorithms require. And number two, what are the tasks that will be automated? Um, not to think that we all will be unemployed, but to think how we can prepare professionals to work with these technologies in the very, very near future. So I really like what some universities are doing in the UK. They have decided to work together under the, the Russell Group. And they have said, you know what? This thing is changing. We have to develop tools for the, the staff, for the community. We have to transform pedagogies. We have to transform the assessments. It makes no sense to keep using the same assessment that we used to use for the last century or centuries. Uh, but at the same time, we have to push harder in an integrity use, an, an ethical use of this technology, and foster for an integrity in the academic profession. So all sorts of transformations are happening at the collective level. So as you see, there are all these driving forces that we can connect to some extent but it will require to develop new proficiencies, new literacies, right? So if we want to address the environment, we will have to develop a sustainable literacy. If we want to explore data in a more intensive way, we will have to develop data literacy or AI fluency. But also we should explore how to foster a much, much more age-inclusive society. So I think some of these things will help us to shape a changing future. So my invitation is to think together. How can we transition from the classic model of the university where well, we go to the university, either in person or remotely, we stay there for a number of years and then we cross this gate and we don't come back ever. To a much more continuous process, a kind of revolving door, an age-friendly university where the diversity is not only focused on the backgrounds and the, the diversity of the programs, but also on the age of the students. I think there's a strong opportunity here addressing some of the challenges that are coming today and in this century. So I don't know if some of you saw in the New York Times three weeks ago when Harari talked about AI, and he, said a very power, he sent a very powerful message. He said, the first aim is to buy time to upgrade our 19th century institutions from an AI world and to learn how to master AI before it masters us. So I think there's a strong opportunity, and I think this Congress is a wonderful time to sit down together and to think what are the options, what are the alternatives, how we can take advantage of that. So, Many of the disruptions that we have explored didn't come because they were planned by the university. They come in the pockets of the students, and they're happening today. But now, it's the role of the universities to think carefully. What are the things that we have to revisit? What are the transformations we have to embrace? 
For those of you who want to have a discussion deeper on this, I welcome you to the workshop today in the afternoon. Now, before closing, I want to say that crises are times of disruption, times of confusion, disagreement, or disappointment. But crises, and a particular combination of crises, can be an opportunity to develop new literacies. New literacy is not to learning to code and decode the world that is important, but also to create new meanings. New meanings in how we're going to navigate in a world where machines seem to generate knowledge. How can we have this new relationship with technologies that seems to automate some of the tasks we do? How can we develop institutions that could be more age inclusive? And overall, how can we design institutions that could be more responsive to the challenge we face today? Ladies and gentlemen, some of you might know this Chinese proverb that basically said, when the winds of change blow, some will build walls, while others build windmills. Today, we are in Spain, in the land of Don Quixote. What a better place to sing together how to translate universities into windmills that can transform this crisis into positive energy. Thank you very much.